the honor of presenting our next speaker to my right. Uh, Zinebjörg Tedessin is a social science researcher and has been a committed activist for gender equality, democratization, and women's land rights throughout her career. Uh, she has been an advocate for the right of social scientists to exist and thrive on the African continent, believing they can generate ideas that can help countries make informed policy decisions. Um, her history shows why she was sent uh, by her family to the United States for her university education uh, in the late 60s and politics became a crucial part of her life in the US. She was immediately exposed to the civil rights movement for racial equality and the feminist movement for gender equality that were emerging there at the time. When she later came back to Ethiopia, she was involved with land reform, viewing it as a means of addressing poverty and promoting democracy in the country. She was also in Zambia, in Namibia. She worked for the United Nations Institute for Namibia, and she traveled extensively in the continent and enriched her knowledge of Africa, basically from being in the midst of the African liberation movements and the construction of the post-independent states. Uh, she's a senior global uh, development consultant for several international organizations, foreign governments, academic institutions, and uh, other sorts of organizations. She is the founding member and first executive secretary of the Association of African Women for Research and Development, based in Senegal, a founding member of the Forum for Social Sciences in Ethiopia, which is the first policy-focused think tank in, in the country, and a long-time associate member of the Ethiopian Women Lawyers Association. She serves and has served on numerous lo local and global boards, including Development Alternatives for Women for a New Era, the United Nations Committee for Development Policy, the Advisory Council for of Ibrahim um, Index for, of African government, Governance, and uh, the Council for the Development of Social Sciences Research in Africa, CODESRIA, where she served as the first and only to date female Deputy Executive Secretary and later as the first female President of the Council. Um, she, is also the vice, she was also the Vice President of the Ethiopian Academy of Sciences. She is an expert on uh, social development and governance with special emphasis on gender and poverty issues. And she is used to writing on strategic questions facing women in Africa. She's currently working on a book on social change in Ethiopia through the prism of women's lives, which we are very much looking forward to reading. So then, without any further ado, to a rejoinder on democratic centralism. I come from a country which is totally neoliberal, but the ruling uh, party uses democratic centralism to this day to run their business. And they tell us, you know, they are keeping, it's in keeping with their Marxist tradition. So um, it was, uh, it resonated a lot for me when I heard this um, notion that has been really completely ahistorical and used to uh, for very many oppressive purposes since the Russian Revolution to the present. But I think for me, um, this uh, celebration, as very many people before me have said, uh, shouldn't be a, a nostalgic look back to the uh, Russian Revolution, um, but a, a critical um, questioning of what has been the legacy and what can we take away from it. And for me, um, having been in that movement for a very long time, it's, I, I will uh, reduce it to two things. One is, as well, my, the previous speaker um, emphasized, the ability to question and rethink constantly, uh, not be uh, insular about what we do. Um, and uh, the next one is to, to hope that change is possible despite the fact of neoliberalism telling us that it's only the change that they introduce that is uh, actually prevalent. I have been given a, a very broad task of uh, talking about democracy, democracy, land, and the challenge for the 21st century. I'm sure I'm going to disappoint you because these are huge <laughs> issues, but let me try. Um, the first thing I want to um, put on the table in line with the uh, emancipatory hypothesis of this conference is that um, I don't buy this celebration of liberal democracy that has taken um, the world by storm and we are every day witnessing the outcome that it can bring very, very strange characters through, through elections that uh, is uh, credible or maybe not 
but nonetheless within the continent of Africa to which I'm going to limit my, uh, my <coughs> note this afternoon, uh, it has been really reduced to occasional elections. Um, some constitutional revisions which are usually not even put to, uh, implemented um, and that's about it. So uh, we do use words like participation, inclusion and so forth in electoral discourse but um, it absolutely is not uh, by any means participatory or inclusive. Um, so the first thing I will try to do is um, indicate what I understand as a citizen of uh, that continent by democracy. Uh, land is another huge issue uh, that has been uh, discussed, at least I came late, so from the, my, my sister from Latin America. Uh, it's a, a life sustaining issue for a lot of us. And in Africa, over 65% of people uh, gain their livelihoods from agriculture. So land is really a life-sustaining issue on many levels uh, and a meaning of citizenship or lack thereof. Um, and so uh, land for me is not the commodity that uh, neoliberals uh, want us to believe it is, uh, but has very many multiple uses. It is a special productive resource. Um, it sustains livelihood. It's a, a source of shelter, social security, um, it's also a source of diversified livelihoods and um, a source of energy, medicine, uh, and a whole wide range of livelihoods, as I mentioned. It also land um, in a context of agrarian society, uh, and I, I limit myself to Africa, which I know is, has also a, sub a subjective dimension. It's a source of respectability, a recognition, a sense of belonging, and the risk-taking, um, it, it provides risk-taking ability. Uh, but most of all, um, the land um, is a, an indication of a social relationship within society. And um, so, uh, in the vast continent of Africa, access to and control and ownership of land is differentiated. It varies from unequal patterns of land concentration exclusion from land and basic livelihood requirements uh, for primary accumulation, marginalization in terms of territorial space and local autonomy, and this inequality is also found in terms of national and local citizenship rights embedded to access to land, especially for women, migrants, ethnic minorities. In other words, the basic structure of land holding inequalities are found along gender, race, class, ethnic-based discriminations in the allocation of land rights. And this has two implications, both in terms of democratization uh, and in terms of uh, land rights uh, to court. And that is that <clears throat> the, in the Marxist tradition, uh, we used to talk about, and some still do, the women question, the agrarian question, the national question, and often enough, even in parties, these were dealt with like silos. There were some people who advocated and were passionate about the land question. Others would work women, as was said, the minority of women would talk about women's rights. And others uh, would talk about uh, ethnic uh, discrimination or uh, work towards that. I think now when we redefine democracy, what has become clear is that if we all stay in the silos that we are passionate about, we do not make progress. So it's both uh, an indication that inequalities are differentiated, but also the basis of alliance building. Um, I have a friend who always talks about a woman is a woman, an oppressed woman, but she can be from a, an ethnic minority and be from a working class. So um, it's not like these, it's three different peoples or three different issues, but one person who experiences these multiple levels of uh, inequalities. So if we, are, if we try to address just one, or as has been embedded in the Marxist tradition, prioritize one over the other. For example, for a very long time, uh, a lot of Marxists uh, only felt comfortable talking about class struggle. 
and ignored all these other inequalities, particularly gender and ethnic um, discriminations. Um, and that really uh, scattered the forces that could have addressed uh, this um, hegemony, capitalist hegemony, over many aspects of our lives. So, as I said, it's both an understanding of the complex issues of uh, inequalities and oppression, and a possibility, as was also suggested by our previous speaker, of alliance building uh, over very many issues and, and making our forces much more stronger. Talking about land in Africa today, there is a very vibrant debate on land. What ought to be, uh, what kind of land reform should um, take place? Um, and it really boils down to uh, should land reform be geared towards increasing productivity, which is the, the neoliberal argument, or should um, it also centrally address issues of social justice? Um, and this debate has been amplified because of the current food, energy, and climate change crisis. Uh, and, but the fact that we're facing all these multiple challenges uh, has not gotten us anywhere near to issues of addressing social justice. So uh, the hegemony of neoliberalism has meant that the market argument or land being used just to increase uh, productivity or capital accumulation is at least the dominant voice, but that does not uh, in any way uh, diminish the emergent and in some places very um, obvious struggles <coughs> over land, what kind of uh, outcome and what kind of rights would describe um, a certain uh, policy agenda, a certain, a certain advocacy and struggles of different uh, social groups. Um, and so, uh, why, why it also has become a very uh, ample debate and very vocal debate has to do with these very many conflicts in Africa that you hear about. In some circles it's talked about as if Africans by its very nature are conflict-ridden societies. And it does not, that's because it does not address the, his, the structural and historical source of, of these conflicts, and I'm arguing that's a major cause of most, if not all, these conflicts is uh, the absence of land rights. Um, and uh, also the uh, growing unemployment that you in Europe experience through deaths in the Mediterranean of young men and women trying to uh, build alternative livelihoods. Um, in, the, in the continent itself, it is felt by intergenerational and intragenerational conflicts because of scarcity of land. So um, the point I'm trying to make, uh, and I do not want to labor the point for this August audience, is that land is a very, very critical resource in the struggle for um, both uh, social justice and a transformed uh, uh, democratic Africa. <coughs> But um, um, there is no consensus about what kind of land reform would be uh, land reform uh, would be promising and towards a transform a transformative uh, future. And part of this has to do with um, the hegemony of structural adjustment, neoliberal policies that have begun since the 1980s. Um, and what's amazing about some of the debates um, is the continuation of the colonial project uh, under a new name, uh, namely uh, neoliberalism. But the colonial um, project tried to the, the colonial project uh, tried to re to eliminate um, um, tenor systems that existed because they felt that it was uh, pre uh, preventing accumulation. Um, and that didn't work, uh, partly for the reasons that were described in the case of Latin America today, the persistence of this customary, in our case also, we call them communal tenure, uh, the, the, the tenacity of people holding to their land systems, and, um, all, uh, and other reasons. And therefore, um, they gave up abolishing the systems, that is the colonial powers, and tried to work with the leadership 
inside these systems. We have chiefs and other uh, local leaders that sustain this system um, of uh, land tenure. Um, but then uh, in the immediate post-independence period, that was uh, changed and um, another, the, the post-independent states also tried to abolish this uh, customary systems, saying that they were backward, then what Africa needed was modernization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that didn't work as, as well in terms of increasing productivity, and also because people resisted this abolition of their um, indigenous tenure systems. And now we see a comeback of this uh, co coalition between chiefs and other leaders of land uh, distribution and the state and international capital. So um, what has happened is that these systems continue to be called customary, communal, but it really masks the massive uh, emergence of land markets and commercial relationship within these um, systems, which are called customary and communal. Uh, but a huge amount of social change is taking place in terms of land being sold under different guise. Guys. And so uh, it, a, a real uh, uh, example of increasing commodification and uh, pro proliferation of transfers of land and widespread competition and conflict over land. Uh, one of the things that I have tried to uh, bring to the attention um, of the public is the disproportionate impact on gender relations that these commodifications <coughs> and transfers of land have over women uh, because in, to begin with, even in the customary systems, they, did, they had unequal access to land. And in fact, they used the same kind of negotiated methods that our colleague talked about today to be able to have some access to land for themselves and their children. Uh, in this changing uh, structure of land in the continent, and particularly the growth of commodification, it has meant um, less and less access to land for women, and therefore destitution, <coughs> conflicts, and a really uh, growth of um, disproportionate levels of poverty among women in the continent. So um, this use of um, uh, customary to, to disguise this heavy uh, changes in land tenure uh, is one of the critical uh, issues that need to be addressed if one is to talk about real democratization and real land rights uh, on the continent. Um, changing names or using names that sound historical uh, can hide a lot of um, inequalities and social dislocations. And, and in many cases, this is what is happening. So uh, the renewed land debates, um, which were, as I said, ignited because of the current food, energy, and financial crisis, particularly since the global financial crisis um, and the climate change, uh, has led to land grabs, which I'm sure most of you are aware. Um, in Africa, um, multinational companies, even uh, universities and their boards and so forth are grabbing land um, in a very visible and uh, very significant ways under the guise of Africa needs increased productivity and that these large farms are going to actually make it possible. And one thing that we see clearly with, with this um, uh, process is that it's not only the all good old multinationals that we knew from way back since colonial period and, and uh, post-colonial period, but uh, folks that we used to think were third world uh, comrades. India being one, but that's because they are just here. But uh, Latin American, uh, I mean, not Latin American, but is other Asian countries like Korea um, and Middle Eastern countries are also part of this land grabbing process that's taking place. And what's ironic is that agriculture, in fact, is declining in Africa because these large farms are usually meant for export crops and not to increase food availability for the local population. And indeed, some of these um, farms have created employment 
both for men and women, uh, but if you look critically at what this employment means, it means low pay, uh, very dangerous working conditions, threatening, very threatening to their health, and irregular. I mean, these farms, for example, in Ethiopia, um, it took the form of growing flowers for the export market. And suddenly, because of the economic crisis in 1998, uh, um, I mean, uh, 2008, um, they, they all, lots of these farms left. It was no longer profitable for them. The market didn't exist in Europe and so forth. So these women were left without any kind of social security employment and their health affected very tremendously. Um, and the only avenue open to them to, to, for their own livelihoods uh, was to, to, to go to work almost in slave-like conditions in the Middle East. And today in very many African countries, particularly in Eastern Africa, the massive migration of women out of farms to um, uh, Latin uh, to Middle Eastern countries uh, is an indication of this land crisis, in a way, because women are getting no way, nowhere with the existing uh, diminishing land, uh, hard working conditions, and uh, very little earnings. And therefore, they opt for migration, which creates another layer of uh, oppression and dislocation for them and their families. Um, so in the process, though, Another um, significant thing to look at in terms of gender and land is um, the World Bank and other um, financial institutions have become the best friends of gender. They promote uh, that land reform should be gender equitable um, and, and promote and push very hardly, uh, very hard uh, for land registration. Um, in, in the name of couples or in the name of individuals in households. And on the face of it, this sounds like a very democratic, very good uh, kind of proposal. But in actual fact, my reading of it, and I'm, I'm definitely not the first nor uh, the only one, is that it's another method of bringing land to the market rather than benefiting women because um, getting titles to land doesn't necessarily mean that they will actually have direct access to it because they need capital, they need uh, labor and other means to put this land into, um, into uh, livelihoods and they don't have that access. And secondly, land has become so diminished that it's not uh, viable enough for, for uh, sufficient livelihoods for couples in households. For example, in my country, is one example where land registration has taken place and women now have land titles, but it has not increased their food production, nor their rights within households, nor, the, nor their voice in the public arena. Um, because it has very little meaning unless it's accompanied with a, a very wide ranging other reforms with this, with this um, uh, land distribution uh, process. And uh, as for um, customary land being very uh, useful uh, to, to, to the local population, uh, as I said before, first of all, uh, because commodification is affecting this pre-existing uh, social relations, um, those who with less voice, like women, migrants, um, ethnic minorities, um, are actually being mar completely more marginalized than they were before because of the mar the marketization of land uh, and um, produce of land. So, um, in this context, uh, what, how, what, how do we see, um, how do I see uh, democratization in the one sense, in the, on the one hand, and um, land on the other going forward? For, for me, democratization has to be much broader than just this um, ritual election process, which you know have respect for to a certain extent, but it doesn't bring about um, any substantive change and does not address the local priorities of people. In fact, in the case of land, uh, the existence of occasional um, elections have meant that um, the use of land 
or the promise of land right, land to electorates as a source of conflict. Because people say, well, you know, in my region, land is not being distributed, so if I were elected, I would distribute land. And people take that seriously because, as I said, land is a life and death issue for very many rural people and urban people, as it, as, as it happens uh, recent, more, much more recently. And therefore, electoral competition uh, tends to um, mobilize um, villagers and illegal settlers and others, and this leave, tends to conflicts. And these have, in fact, been documented as sources of conflict uh, in many African countries, because post-election, these uh, electoral promises cannot be delivered. So um, this um, um, celebration of just election as the main component of democratization leaves out a whole host of other issues that need to be addressed if people are to have social justice and lead decent lives. Um, and for me, the first thing that needs to be done by, uh, to be pushed for by progressive forces is the transformation of the state, or returning it to a democratic and developmental state. One outcome of neoliberalism, of course, as most of you know, is pushing the, the state out of its major functions to uh, being a company of facilitating markets for uh, external, mostly external, but also local uh, capitalists. And so returning the state to its function of providing employment, which has been completely removed from the development agenda, of providing social security and social services, and um, other functions of the state that the immediate post-independent African countries enjoyed, but no longer do because of neoliberal hegemony is one thing. But that this does not mean a return to a sort of democratic centralism that was referred to before and that exists in some, uh, in some places, that the state needs to have uh, democratic values and democratic principles, which for me means you know, listening to people and addressing their immediate uh, needs and uh, using the resources of a given country uh, for the benefit and social welfare of the people and not just for external forces and um, local well-to-do people. Uh, the other thing that has to do with a transformation of the major macroeconomic policy so that it addresses uh, accumulation of a, a, a country itself rather than creating just markets. Uh, in Africa today, our ma macroeconomic policy is mostly geared to facilitating markets of uh, goods. And um, the competition to attract foreign investment has meant a real distortion of our own priorities. Uh, for example, these um, elections that I referred to, often uh, um, parliamentarians who have absolutely no say on our budget, on our, uh, the way that the country ought to be run, and so forth, because these are mostly decided in uh, IMF corridors and other places external to the continent. So um, having institutions that actually reflect the wishes and support of the electorate uh, and not just uh, um, occasional um, elect electoral competition is another way of making sure that democratization actually takes place. And in the case of Africa, and to link uh, the topic uh, that I am trying to address, uh, land and uh, real land reform that transforms social relationships in the continent uh, is the, ought to be the core of a democratic project. It cannot be left to just uh, certain electoral competition periods uh, or to just market forces and so forth, but really respond to the actual needs of uh, landless people, people uh, who work on land and whose livelihood basically depends on, uh, on land for both subjective and objective reasons. And for this, there is ample reason that despite um, land scarcity becoming the real character of land uh, on the continent, this can be done if there is a macroeconomic policy that also creates employment in other sectors. 
at the point, at the moment, employment, as I said, has been removed from the uh, agenda, from the development agenda, and uh, at best, there is reference to um, people creating their own entrepreneurial um, small-scale um, capital accumulation processes, but this won't do. And uh, Africa has sufficient resources uh, and abilities to create real employment, uh, especially for young people who make up almost 60% of the population in our continent. And the macroeconomic policy also have to have a very robust social policy that addresses the needs of people, which most of you in this room probably take for granted. But in our part of the world are daily struggles, the access to water, access to energy, um, access to other um, household needs that sustain livelihoods, children, and, and so forth. Um, one of the outcomes of the neoliberal policies that started in the 1980s has been to really uh, reduce social services to the bare minimum. And when you hear of uh, scourges like Ebola, uh, like other diseases that are affecting thousands, if not millions, of our population, it's because governments who can afford it, who have the resources, are no longer um, investing in health services, in uh, schools, um, and roads, and other essential services that uh, a state, particularly a democratic state, should be concerned about. And therefore, the outcome of that is um, the dislocation and real deprivation of uh, large sectors of the society. So land alone will not be a solution, or will not be uh, the, a response to full democratization. But it has to be a huge component, because it does affect uh, a very predominant part of the African continent. The other aspect of um, uh, democracy now, or going forward, that I foresee, is allowing the type of real robust uh, organizations be it political parties, but also other uh, organizations where people can come and feel a part of a solution to all these problems that exist. And what we see on the continent is people really eager, even under this false participation where they bring people after something has been decided and they put them in a room and say, oh, it's been participatory. People are really eager to be part of the solution to the very many problems that affect our continent. They also want to see that the resources of a country are equitably distributed and used. Um, and they would like good schools, they want their children to have employment, and so forth and so on. But there are no forums for this kind of discussions because they are discouraged. Um, and so democratization means those kinds of organizations which really mobilizes people's voices in ways that are constructive both to the participants and to the country and the continent that they live in. So for me, uh, land is important, has to be addressed, especially in a continent like Africa, where other forms of industrialization, in fact, what we have been going through since 1980 is a process of deindustrialization, and that is one claim, uh, and one that's getting lo lots of support on the continent is the process of reintroducing industrialization as an important component of employment. Uh, but at the same time, addressing the land needs, the um, land hunger that exists, and also deal with these structural problems that are causing conflicts and affecting tremendous dislocations and migrations. So um, just in short, going forward, I'm looking forward to um, a democratization that is really democratic, that responds to um, the needs of people and um, addresses social relationships from gender relations to ethnic uh, and other forms of dislocations. Um, and in a way that it does not prioritize one over the other, because that's what usually happens. Um, secondly, to have a, a, a macroeconomic um, policy that is really responsive to the development needs and resource availabilities of a country. Um, and 
these are really the type of democracies that, and, and having robust people's organizations that where men, women, and young people can come and express uh, their visions of a better future.